So this is the History Unfolded US Newspapers in the Holocaust Project. And you have the URL here for those of you attending in person or virtually, it's newspapers.ushmm.org. Uh, as any good teacher would do, I'm going to share with you my agenda for the evening and also our objectives. Uh, and it's, by a series of questions that I will ask and answer. And if you have any questions of your own along the way, uh, please do uh, put them in the Q&A and I will monitor that. If there's a pressing question, I can answer it during my presentation, but we'll also leave time for questions at the end. First question is, what is History Unfolded? Then why does History Unfolded matter? How has the Pacific Northwest contributed? and how can you integrate history unfolded in classrooms, uh, followed by uh, hopefully about 10 to 15 minutes of your own questions. And then uh, my objectives for you are fairly straightforward. I want you all to learn what history unfolded is, have a pretty good overview understanding of the project uh, and how this uh, resource can be useful for you in your classrooms. See, there was a uh, question already about the, oops, let me go back here. Uh, someone wanted to see the URL one more time. Uh, hopefully the website is working. It was uh, down a little bit earlier today, but I just checked before the presentation and it was back up for me. Newspapers.ushmm.org. Uh, I'll go ahead and start talking about what History Unfolded is to make sure you have time to uh, jot down the URL or to go to the website if you're interested. Uh, it is a citizen history project of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. We've been running this project for about six and a half years now, uh, and we're asking a series of historical research questions. This project is part of the museum's uh, initiative on Americans and the Holocaust in which we're looking at American knowledge of and responses to the Holocaust from 1933 to 1945. Uh, the History Unfolded project was the first project or resource of the initiative, and it predates a lot of the exhibitions and materials that it's associated with. Uh, the project, uh, in a nutshell, has three main components, learn, research, and contribute. Uh, in a minute, I will tell you uh, what each of those steps are. I mentioned that this project is centered around historical research questions. As a former high school social studies teacher, I, I love these types of questions because they're questions that I grapple with, uh, that students should be grappling with in their classes as well. Um, when you're looking at something like the Holocaust uh, from a US perspective, what information was available to the American public about the Holocaust why it was taking, while it was taking place? How did newspapers report about the Nazi threat and the events of the Holocaust if there in fact was news coverage uh, in the period? And if there was news coverage in the period, what did people do? Did Americans take action? Um, how did they react? What were their responses? These are broad questions. They're aligned with the larger Americans in the Holocaust initiative. And so the uh, museum thought we could look at newspapers uh, from the 1930s and the 40s in particular to help us answer these questions because newspapers were a main medium by which uh, Americans received their news in the 1930s and 40s. There were local newspapers all over the country uh, and it provides students with a really interesting opportunity to help us answer these questions uh, while also developing their own uh, knowledge of the Holocaust and historical research skills and thinking skills as well. And so the first step of the project is to learn about different events of the Holocaust. We have on the website now about 45 different topics. So students working on this project don't learn about every single event within the period. 
We focus on events of the Holocaust directly, such as the Nazi boycott of Jewish businesses and Kristallnacht and the liberation of the concentration camp. We also include a lot of event modules that provide historical context. So we're looking at things like how were people in the country uh, treating their fellow citizens? We have event modules that look at the uh, persecution of Black Americans or of uh, 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 Latin Americans as well. Um, we have event modules that look at America's growing movement towards war with a peacetime draft. Uh, and so on. And so uh, these different modules have keywords to assist students that are doing their research with online databases and archives uh, and dates to check that assist students uh, in particular microfilm research. The majority of our students on this project have done research through digitized collections, especially once the pandemic started. Uh, but we have had some really interesting uh, and fascinating experiences where students have gone into physical libraries and archives and done microfilm research uh, and really have had an unforgettable experience. Uh, there's a lesson plan uh, for the main part of having students submit research. I'll talk more about that in a moment. Research, this is the really fun part. The students are learning history by doing history. And so they will either use online archives or in the photos here, you see students going to libraries using microfilm, uh, scanning page by page for relevant articles. And at first we were a little nervous that students wouldn't like this, but we have found generally they really find it fascinating. And to them it's detective work, it's uh, hands-on, it's ancient sort of retro technology that they really like. And so they will uh, do that research in the newspapers and then contribute their findings to our database. Uh, we're essentially collecting metadata around these newspaper articles. So information such as the headline, subheadline, author byline, uh, page number. Uh, students also have to take an image of the article on the page with all that metadata visible because our team of reviewers on the back end are going to check to make sure all the type data is accurate to uh, the image itself. And so that's a really important point. If you do adopt this project to have students submit research, make sure those images show everything that they're typing in. Uh, and this is a great opportunity for students to reflect on what they found as well. So second question is why does History Unfolded matter? Uh, the most important way, and as a former classroom teacher, uh, I feel very passionate about this, is to engage learners in an authentic way. Uh, I tried my best as a classroom teacher to make sure students saw the relevance of what they were learning in their classroom. And this applies not only in a social studies class, uh, it works very well in English language arts. Uh, it can be used uh, to teach uh, other languages like Spanish, for instance. Um, there are a number of different applications. Uh, and the students, they are learning media literacy skills, historical thinking skills, the history of the Holocaust along the way. Uh, the image on the right here is of a, a website that students in Illinois created that was modeled off of the History Unfolded website, but they applied the same structure of the website to the Rwandan genocide and had students in their school uh, look at the Rwandan genocide and submit articles about that. And so the applications are somewhat endless for this project. Uh, and it's really been rewarding. Let's give you an example of some of the feedback we've received from students working on History Unfolded. Uh, as you can see here, we have had students develop their awareness of the Holocaust in the United States. And students thinking a little bit more critically, not only about what information Americans had access to, but what Americans did and did not do. And so the other thing that very often happens with this project, it's students are looking at the history, but it opens up the door to talk about uh, today uh, and media today and our role in a society, our role in a democracy. Uh, and I know that if I were still uh, teaching in a classroom, that is something that I would wanna regularly be talking about. The other reason why the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum is embarking upon this history unfolded project 
it to fill in the, his, the gaps in the historical record. There's been a fair amount of newspaper coverage on the Holocaust, but a lot of that was done in the 1980s and the early 2000s. It focused mostly on the biggest newspapers around the country, such as the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, the Chicago Tribune. It didn't include as much information about, say, newspapers in Washington State, uh, in Oregon, or in Idaho, for example. Uh, in addition, a lot of the coverage in the past has focused prim primarily on the so-called mainstream press. Uh, what about the black press? What about Jewish newspapers, Catholic and Christian newspapers, labor newspapers? Uh, this project, uh, what I'm very passionate about doing as well, along with my team, is to fill in those gaps as well. What about newspapers written in languages other than English? Uh, and so this is a really fascinating opportunity to update the historical record and also to get um, this information in digitized format. So what you see on this screen is a political cartoon um, from the Pittsburgh Courier, which was a historically black press newspaper and it's still in existence today. Uh, and it is about the refugee crisis uh, and about some of the, uh, the hypocrisy in the United States in which uh, the US was uh, opening its arms to a certain number of refugees into the country uh, while treating uh, black Americans um, you know, with racism and uh, discrimination. And so uh, you can see this is one example of how we're really getting a more nuanced uh, understanding of the past. I mentioned earlier that this project is meaningful work that the museum used in its initiative on Americans in the Holocaust. And I'm sure some of you uh, do a lot of work with our museum. Uh, we have a special exhibition uh, currently on site at the museum's lower level, Americans in the Holocaust, um, the main Americans in the Holocaust exhibition, which includes an interactive wall map uh, with several dozen articles contributed from students and adult volunteers to History Unfolded. The traveling exhibition, which is on site right now in Spokane, which is very exciting, has even more articles from History Unfolded. And I'll be uh, showing uh, some examples of that as well. The other part in the physical Americans in the Holocaust in Washington, DC, is the uh, Wagner Rogers Child Refugee Bill section. Uh, the curator selected letters to the editor uh, to this question about whether the United States should accept additional child refugees from Germany um, beyond the existing quota. Uh, and that really helped them to tell the story of this debate around whether the U.S. would do that or not. And so on the physical walls are those quotations. There is an online version of Americans in the Holocaust, and we'll be sending out uh, links to all the resources I'm talking about today. I highly encourage you also to look at this online American in the Holocaust exhibition. Uh, it includes several dozen articles from History Unfolded that are different from the ones in the uh, Washington, D.C. Americans in the Holocaust and the one in Spokane right now. There are also uh, different lesson resources, personal stories. Uh, most of the videos from the Americans in the Holocaust exhibition are on the online uh, site as well. So I highly encourage you to check that out. So a little bit more about where the project is right now. As of September, 2022, we are about six and a half years old. Uh, we have about 5,800 known contributors to History Unfolded. That number is most likely a low estimate because a lot of times teachers create an account for an entire class. Some people use the website, but don't necessarily register. We have 3,200 known teachers to the website. Again, that is most likely an underestimate of the number of teachers who have used this project. We have had submissions from um, all over the country and we have had participation from schools uh, almost in every single state at this point. The project is designed primarily for secondary and university level students, but we have had upper elementary uh, school students participate. We've had Holocaust survivors submit research. We have adult volunteers working on their own. So the audience and the participants, the citizens, historians, 
very broad group of individuals. And then the newspapers themselves. Uh, we have over 50,000 published submissions. We just reached that milestone about a month ago. We we're very excited about that. Uh, from all 50 states, Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, US military service. And you can see some of the diversity and the types of newspapers that I was talking about we're really trying to get a better representation from. Uh, so university newspapers, um, and I don't know if we have anything from Gonzaga, uh, if the newspaper was in existence at the time, but that'd be another example of what we could add if not. Uh, Jewish press newspapers, black press newspapers, uh, and then you can see the list of the different languages some of these newspapers are in as well. And I mentioned in particular the opportunity if you uh, teach a, a language other than English, uh, it could be a really interesting opportunity to use this project. So now I want to hone in a little bit more about the Pacific Northwest uh, and see how folks from your region have helped to contribute to History Unfolded. Again, let me know if you have any questions if I'm going too fast. Um, here's a word cloud that I created with uh, some of the participation from the Pacific Northwest that I'm aware of. Uh, and teachers often create a group, which is one way that we become aware of their involvement. Uh, sometimes students contribute on their own. Uh, a lot of the project is still done on a one-on-one -on -one level with uh, communication with me and the individual teachers. At the community manager, um, I exist to serve teachers and students. Uh, on this project. So if you are really interested in what you see tonight and you want to get involved, please reach out to me. I'd be happy to do a virtual presentation with your students to help you figure out the best way to implement this project. I'll be telling you a little bit later on about where the project is headed about a year from now. Uh, and so you can see we have universities, we have middle schools, we have high schools, uh, and we have public schools and private schools. And I wanna highlight a couple of contributions from students and adults in this area as well. So I would be remiss if I didn't talk about uh, one of our adult volunteers named Pat. Pat is our number one contributor in history unfolded to date, hands down. Uh, so you should all be proud that uh, our number one power user comes from the Pacific Northwest. Uh, Pat, Pat has contributed over 10,000 articles to History Unfolded, so that is roughly one-fifth of the database. She is a uh, retired librarian who is really dedicated to this project, has focused a lot on newspaper articles in the Pacific Northwest, has also written a blog post with some research strategies um, that has been immensely helpful for us. Uh, and so we are greatly indebted to the work of Pat on History Unfolded. Uh, and then I wanted to mention specifically because I hope that you all have a chance to see the traveling version of Americans in the Holocaust, uh, either if you're on site now or if you're tuning in virtually, you get a chance to come uh, at some point while it's on site. Uh, this is the tablet interactive uh, that shows the newspaper coverage uh, it is a version of that uh, image I showed you earlier with the students looking at the three individual uh, wall maps in the DC version of this exhibition. But what's really cool about this version is it actually includes more articles from each state. So there are three articles from Washington, three articles from Oregon, and from Idaho, for example. We tried to get geographic diversity. So we actually have an article uh, straight from Spokane uh, in this tablet interactive. So I encourage you to check that out um, when you go and see the Americans in the Holocaust exhibition. Pat contributed one of the three articles from uh, Washington. So some of those articles in that interactive we had to curate uh, due to either copyright issues or in some cases the scan wasn't very good. So we had to find an alternate image, but about half of the, the total uh, Articles in that interactive are from adult and student volunteers. And this one's from the Seattle Post Intelligencer. And you can see uh, the article is over here. It says, German boycott paralyzes Jewish business for day. Two deaths mark movement, few disorders, women active. 
as an Associated Press story. It is on the front page. Uh, it is very prominent. But I would also encourage you to see what else you see uh, on this page. And if I was doing this more as a workshop, I take some time now to uh, take questions. Um, but just in your head, um, look at the page and take a minute just to see what else uh, is being reported on. So you may have noticed some things like uh, the end of prohibition. Uh, they're talking about beer licenses. Uh, this for many Americans was very welcome news. They were excited about the end of prohibition. Uh, you'll see an article on the front page about FDR cutting uh, money for veterans pay. Um, and another article uh, to the far right of the page on uh, fire stations being closed due to the economic impact of the Great Depression. And so one of the really exciting things about History Unfolded is students aren't just learning Holocaust history when they engage in this project. They're learning US history in the historical context. They're also learning their local history about some of the information and the, the news, uh, what's happening in their own community. And there's also an article here about uh, the German officials, agencies, and Einstein's money in the bank. And we have a particular event module, not only on the boycott of Jewish businesses, but on Einstein renouncing his German citizenship. I wanna highlight just a few other um, contributions here. Uh, we have this one from uh, a student named Caleb. And uh, let me just look up here, remembering where Caleb is from. So Caleb is a student from Northwest Nazarene University. Thank you so much, Caleb, for this contribution to History Unfolded. Uh, and Caleb found an article, uh, it's an editorial about the German government forcing Jews to wear yellow stars. Uh, and this editorial was actually syndicated in a number of newspapers around the United States at the time. That's not something I knew was the case until I started looking at many of these submissions that not only were some of the news stories uh, reprinted in many newspapers, but some of the editorials also were. Uh, this is at the beginning of the editorial section uh, on the editorial page, and I crop portions of the text. It's too big to show on the screen, uh, but you can see, and this is toward the, the end of the editorial, uh, it talks about the Nazis compelling Jews to wear the yellow star of David. They intend it as a badge of dishonor, but is a signal of brotherhood an outward sign to distinguish brothers, symbol of an inward and unconquerable strength. Um, one of the things that's really interesting about students working on this project as well is it helps students to avoid the historical uh, hindsight. In 1941, uh, the, the Holocaust, uh, as many of us know it today, as far as the actual mass extermination of the Jews uh, was, was just starting to take place uh, around this time. Uh, it was not something that many people knew about. Uh, and so uh, this editorial writer didn't know the end of the story, didn't know that 6 million people would be killed. Uh, and so their, their view, their reaction uh, is based on the knowledge that they had at the time. And then we have uh, another student con contribution by Christopher. And this is a student from uh, River Ridge High School in Olympia. So thank you, Christopher, for this contribution as well. Uh, and so now we're looking a, a little bit ahead. This is the end of the period in May of 1945, around the time of liberation. Uh, and what's really fascinating is it is a news article uh, from a soldier, Sergeant uh, James Art uh, from Seattle. Uh, who is writing back home about his experience uh, and what he witnessed uh, when he uh, helped liberate the, the camps. And so I pulled out a quotation here, and this is from, in the Seattle Daily Times. And he says, all the horrors and brutality you've heard and read about is true as far as these SS troops are concerned. 
I used to think it was propaganda to make us fight, but now I've seen it with my own eyes. What I really love about this piece is you can pull so much out from this. One, you have a soldier who is making it clear that knowledge was available from earlier uh, because he admits that even he was aware of some of that information, but assumed that it was propaganda. I mean, you see this nuance of there was information, but did Americans believe it? Uh, and then you see the reactions at the end of the war uh, from veterans and what people in Seattle and other parts of the country uh, could have known and how they would grapple with it during this time period. But I intentionally showed you an article from 1933, 1941, and 1945 to show that this information was present in many newspapers throughout. Uh, so I want to make sure to leave plenty of time to talk about using History Unfolded in classrooms. Uh, and so I, I know that it is tough to be a teacher right now. Uh, you often don't have a lot of time. Uh, in certain areas, there might be restrictions on what you can and cannot teach. So I understand flexibility is really key. So here are some various different ways that you could use this project. But uh, one, you could have students in a course or an internship submit articles. What I showed you up to this point, that is the main way that we've been talking about history unfolded. You have the opportunity to do that later this fall uh, and also in the spring. I will be very clear that uh, since we've been running this project for six and a half years, uh, we intend only to make that available uh, to have students submit articles for this upcoming school year. So I know if I was a classroom teacher, I might want to think about something I can use for multiple years. I just want to be very clear that there's a one year window uh, this school year that we've just started now for students to submit. But if you're interested um, and you think that students can do that, by all means, we would love to have your help. We need as much submissions or as much research as we can get, because once that window is closed, Whatever we have in the database is what scholars and future students are going to get. So the more quality research we have, the better. You could also use our lesson plans. The first lesson plan I mentioned in the learn section of the website is the main lesson plan that talks about how to use this project to submit research. We have three other lesson plans. They could be used in your classroom without having students submit research. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, you can also organize public or private research sprints for the next year. Um, I'll talk about that in a minute. And then starting hopefully next school year, so fall 2023, we will be transitioning this website from primarily collecting data to making the material as accessible uh, as possible. And so um, stay tuned uh, because if you can't fit this into your curriculum this year, uh, the web experience should be much easier to plug and use right away next year. Uh, and that will consist in a large sense of downloadable articles to the website. Uh, we have about uh, 5,000 plus downloadable articles right now. I hope to add at least 5,000 more by next year. We want to have more robust search capabilities. Uh, we want to be able to provide additional lesson plans and visualizations. Um, we're still figuring out exactly what it'll look like. Got another uh, question here. Okay, great. So the For Educators or Teacher Resources page um, is where you will find our lesson plans. And we will be sharing a link to that page with you as well. Uh, if you scroll down the page, you'll see three lesson plans I'm about to talk to you about. Uh, you may not be able to see it very well, but on the right, there is a how to read old newspapers guide. That one is fantastic. Um, it is a click through guide, highlights various parts of a historical newspaper because we found very quickly, and you might know this better than I do, that most students today do not read print newspapers. Many of them have never read a historical newspaper before, and they need guidance, especially since newspapers were laid out in a complicated fashion back then. Uh, we have a step-by-step -step guide for teaching. Uh, we also have uh, different kind of smaller lesson plans as well. So three specific lesson plans we've created in the last two years or so. Uh, the first one I wanna talk about is about the black press. Uh, this lesson plan uh, is one of my favorites 
uh, because you can have students learn not only about the Holocaust, but they can learn about how people in the black press uh, responded to the Holocaust. At the same time, they're learning Holocaust history, they're learning US history, they're learning black history. And so it goes into uh, the history of the black press. It has a worksheet activity where you learn how to read a print newspaper, in particular a black press newspaper. Um, it includes voices um, from black Americans at the time. Uh, and it focuses on responses in particular. Uh, and drawing connections from the past to today. So it includes political cartoons, letters to the editor, editorials, um, and is very rich. So I would highly recommend taking a look at that one. The second one, if you have any students that are either fluent in Spanish and learning English, or maybe they're uh, learning Spanish, uh, we created a fully bilingual lesson plan on the response to St. Louis. And we curated this lesson plan with three Spanish language newspapers in the United States. Uh, and it compares and contrasts the nature of the reporting around the same time about the St. Louis, which was a ship that carried uh, Jewish, primarily Jewish refugees uh, to the Americas, uh, was denied admittance uh, in the United States and in Cuba and uh, eventually went back to Europe, where sadly many of those passengers were killed during the Holocaust. Uh, and this uh, lesson plan uh, looks at not only the history of the Holocaust, but puts in the context of immigration uh, and other local issue, or sorry, issues to Latin America. Uh, and it is supplemented with quality secondary sources, such as from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum's uh, encyclopedia. Oh, there's a really good question here. So um, I'll answer that question uh, at the end. What's a good question about submitting research? Okay, and then um, the third lesson plan I wanna talk about is specifically at uh, how youth or young people responded to the Holocaust. This looks at university uh, newspapers in particular uh, and some of the actions that students on college campuses took. Uh, and it's a really good way to get high school or university level students thinking about what their role is. It is the lesson plan that had the most connections today. Uh, it looks at how specifically to analyze headlines, which arguably is even more important to do today where uh, a lot of websites are just full of headlines until you click on them uh, or social media posts just have headlines. Uh, and so it's really skills-based, uh, but it also does an overview of the content history of not only the Holocaust, but um, university reactions. And like I said, it gets students to think a little bit more about what is possible? What kind of action can they take? Um, and it's realistic that students can't do everything, but there are practical things they can do to try to make a difference in their world. I want to touch upon uh, the research sprint model. Um, so fundamentally, a research sprint is a collaborative research event. Um, it can be done completely virtually, it can be done completely in person, and it can be done in a hybrid format. Uh, and typically they will take place over a few hours on a certain day of the week. Uh, and it's really important for the hosting organization to make sure they have access to those newspapers in the 1930s and 40s. And I and the rest of the History and Folder team can work with you if you're interested in doing a research sprint. Uh, and uh, you can design it by theme, you can design it by newspaper, you could design it by uh, particular events on the History Unfolded website. Uh, virtual sprints have been very popular uh, during the pandemic uh, in which students or adults look at online uh, archives uh, and do a sprint for maybe two hours. In-person sprints typically are a little longer. Uh, you could also do asynchronous sprints uh, in which people are using say a handful of microfilm readers of the course of a week or a month and are taking turns about doing the research. Um, they would look for the events we're interested in and they would submit the data the same way. Uh, our team can provide a lot of help in getting that set up. 
It's also an opportunity for people to work together and to discuss their findings. Uh, in the physical research sprint option, they can go out to lunch or dinner after as a group or have a discussion in a meeting room. Uh, in the virtual space, there's usually about 20 to 30 minutes at the end of the program for uh, the participants to reflect uh, and to discuss with one another. And then I just wanted to uh, talk about the, um, the History Unfolded website here. Uh, let me pop out of the slideshow for one second and pull up the, the live website here. So uh, one of the things I highly recommend is going to menu and explore user research. This is actually going to answer the, the open question about redundancy. So there are two reasons you would come to this menu and explore user research page. One is students were trying to submit research issue unfolded. This is where you come to avoid duplicating research. Uh, and so students aren't sure something's in the database. I recommend that they search by state uh, and or by city. Um, you can also search by newspaper name. Uh, so we actually have a, a number of Spokane newspapers. Uh, so we could try the Spokane um, Chronicle. In fact, it's under the Spokane Daily Chronicle. There we go. So we have 907 results. So you are very fortunate. I think a lot of those were from our uh, power user, Pat, who submitted these. But such a rich representation uh, right in Spokane uh, in History Unfolded. So if the students wanted to submit an article about the boycott of Jewish businesses in March of 1933, they found a March 1st, 1933 article with this headline. They would first check to make sure it's not in the database. Um, and since it is, they wouldn't submit it. Uh, if they look and let's say they found an article on March 3rd uh, that was related, and we see there's no article between March 2nd and March 7th, then they could submit that article and be reasonably confident that we haven't received it before. Uh, so that's one way to use this. Um, and yes, we would love to have original research, especially six and a half years into the project. That is going to be one of the challenges some students might face. The other recommendation I have is to reach out to me. If you're interested in doing the project, I can give you a better sense of what newspapers we may have covered or what research from our end for researchers and scholars and students in the future we're most interested in. Uh, the other reason to come to this page is if you're using this material just to see what we have. So you can click on, for instance, one of these stories. In some cases, the article was submitted via newspapers.com and it was embedded. And so you can easily read this article on the page. Uh, and if you want to search by those, uh, you can click this box, location of research, newspapers.com. Now, not everyone will be uh, optimized for that. You can see you can see this page, but you can't really read anything. That's going to be one of the things we're going to uh, enhance a year from now. Uh, but you can see that there are a number of articles um, from this newspaper uh, and this particular newspaper, actually, most of them were clipped for the whole, sorry, uh, yeah, clipped for the whole page. But um, we don't have it in Spokane, but if you also select article download available, you'll see we have over 5,000 downloadable articles. And so in this case, for many of them, they have a full newspaper page of high quality. So I know teachers are eager for ready to use primary sources. That is my best recommendation for that. We're also adding additional filters here. So you can look at black press newspapers and do a drop down to see which ones we have. I don't know that we have any from Washington State or Oregon or Idaho. Um, and then all these other filters as well. So um, if you're interested in using the website for this purpose, I'm happy to work with you since we're not optimized for it quite yet. Let me know what you want to do and I can steer you in the right direction. I also wanted to point out that teacher resources section from the menu. It's not so easy to find here. We also have a, so this has all of our lesson plans here that I was talking about, the materials. 
And then we have a resource center, which includes some of the same materials for teachers and other materials like testimonials and um, blog posts written by teachers, research tips. There actually is a research tip specifically on how to avoid duplicating research. And so if you scroll down, there it is. So this would be another really useful resource to help students avoid duplicating their research. And that is, let me just check. Let's go back for one minute to give my contact information. And then I think we're ready for questions. So if you have questions, please think of them now. And I'd be happy to take them. I'd love to have a discussion with you all. Uh, this is my email address. Uh, you can call me on my work cell phone as well. If you have any questions, I would love to hear from you. Uh, we're really interested in having your help. We're so appreciative of the help of all the people in the Pacific Northwest to date. Um, please don't be shy. Again, this is the reason the museum has a community manager. Okay. Um, so we do have a question in the chat um, about where do I go to access the page, how to read a historical newspaper? Great question. So let me get back to that one. Yeah, I'll, I'll show this now that I'm back on the website. Thank you for that question. If you go to teacher resources and then you go to how to read old newspapers. So this is again, the four educators page and we will send you a link to the four educators page. Uh, maybe we can even send an extra link for this one. Uh, there we go. So it'll click through and it tells you some information about the front page. And then it tells you specifically where the articles on the page are. You can see this wage hour app compromise story uh, goes all the way across. It's a banner headline and then it continues down the right column. And uh, so it points out that article. Uh, you can see how these two articles are divided by rectangles and then it highlights the uh, different stories, the dog legs with the layout, and then the headline specifically. And then the fact that it's one column but multiple stories. And then a little bit about byline. In, in sub headlines, um, students typically will be really confused about uh, bylines. And yes, there's a great question now in the chat about common sources such as the Associated Press, what was known as United Press in the 30s and 40s, today's GPI and others. Uh, we're very interested in tracking how an individual newspaper story from a wire service was um, reported on throughout the country. We have found that uh, in every case that I've seen, the newspaper itself wrote the headline, but the byline story would either be printed in full or in part. So they might truncate a couple of the paragraphs out from the wire service. Uh, but we actually have a researcher right now at the museum who is looking at comparing those different uh, same AP story across various newspaper and doing visualization, doing other kind of sophisticated analyses. So um, we are very interested in that. Uh, and the duplication uh, is, is vast from the time period. We find that much of the reporting in History Unfolded today comes from the AP or the UP. Uh, there were bylines for the Jewish press and the black press, for instance. Uh, and Catholic newspapers and labor newspapers. Those are very interesting too. Uh, we find that if the newspaper was a daily and it were, uh, subscribed to one of those byline, or sorry, those wire services, there's likely to be reporting from the time period. Um, if it was a weekly newspaper and did not subscribe to a wire service, you're not as likely to find material. So one of the important things for you, if you're interested in having students submit research, is to either work with me or directly, or maybe with a librarian, um, if you're not a librarian, to find out um, how the newspaper reported, what they're likely to be reporting. Because you don't want to set students up for failure if the newspaper didn't report on anything in terms of international events, for example. Okay. 
I'm gonna go off to share for a second. See if we have more questions. I, I think we have about maybe 10 minutes left. Are there any other questions? And, and I do appreciate pointing out that uh, it's Spokane. Um, as you can probably tell, I am not a native of the Pacific Northwest. So um, I appreciate everyone bearing with me, but um, really fascinating research. Do we have any others? We do have at least one more coming in from here, Eric, if you'll just be patient. Of course. Um, it might be coming from Paul in the q a uh, okay this is a good question about sequence and steps i'll actually uh go back on the share screen and show you this um in fact i can take a couple more minutes to do that to point out some more things since we do have time i was kind of worried about going over so uh let me show you uh, i'm logged in um you can create an account it's free uh, there's a specific area where you can create an account as an educator. It would show up here if you don't have an account somewhere around here. Um, one of the advantages of identifying yourself as an educator is you'll get specific emails uh, for educators on this project. And I try to be very mindful. We send maybe six to eight emails a year on average. Uh, so I try not to uh, overwhelm people. Um, and so you do need to have an account in order to submit research. And so the sequence would be, uh, again, you learn about the different events. And I'm gonna pull up now the event module pages. So one of the ones we recently added was on the Reichstag fire in February of 1933. Uh, and so uh, there are the keywords I was talking about, especially for online research. These are not exhaustive. Uh, there is background information, uh, and so uh, we understand that students may not be studying the Holocaust in depth while using this project. Uh, this will give them some helpful context, the dates to check for their online or their microfilm research. It's especially critical for microfilm research so students know where to start and which reels to pull. So that's the uh, learn portion for the events. And then the research, we do have a guide here, find newspaper archive, although we haven't updated it um, since about 2016. So for instance, if I look at Washington, there are some known collections, but you're probably better off. Uh, oh, look, I've got the bulletin here too. Um, better off contacting a librarian to find out what's available to you. And then if you find a relevant article, as we mentioned before, you would check the database to make sure that we uh, don't have it. And then you would go either to menu and submit research or my profile and submit research. So I'm gonna do it from that. And then here are the steps. You can let us know if uh, you looked in the newspaper and there was no reporting. This is designed for students who are looking at a newspaper that didn't have any reporting, want to still get credit for class. Um, but it is very hard to prove the non-existence of something. So most people use just submit an article when they find something. And then uh, they'll select the relevant event module. In some cases, an article addresses more than one event. So choose the one that it most closely in your mind uh, is about. And then you would type in this metadata. So as I was talking about before, Okay, so Spokane Chronicle, and then we have the archive. This could be, I don't know, do we have something for the Seattle Public Library, for instance? And then you would type in all this data about the newspaper, page number, date, headline, subheadline, byline. If there isn't one of this, you would just leave it blank. 
and then you would attach the image for an online archive a high resolution full page scan would be most ideal um, if not as much of the image that can show um, all of that metadata essentially in order for the article to be approved uh, all of this information students type has to be in this image they would attach it like an email or if you're using newspapers.com they would clip it and then they would verify all the metadata they can add a comment teachers can require a comment if they want um, and then they submit it. Our review team tries to give feedback within a week, if not sooner, especially for student contribution. And we give students an email um, to every one of their submissions uh, to give them feedback. And so they'll find out their article is approved, if not how they can make edits to fix it and get it approved, if it can be uh, accepted into database, and if it's just not relevant at all, we'll just let them know. Uh, and so that personal communication with our reviewers and the students is also one of the valuable parts of this project. Okay, uh, so the three C3 standards, that's a really good question. Thank you for that. The museum uh, just generally, uh, while we keep the standards in mind, we don't design our lesson plan to any particular uh, standards because we are a national museum. Uh, and while that would be probably the closest fit, um, just while we do keep them in mind, but we, we don't specifically mention any standards with our lesson plans. So um, I apologize if that's an inconvenience for you, but um, you will probably find that many of the objectives written in the lesson plans uh, do correspond with those standards. Um, okay, so there's another question about reporting on persecution of other victims, how does one search for such articles? Uh, so right now, the searching for that is, is not optimized. I hope in a year it will be. Um, in the case of the black press, I do think if you just search black press newspapers, you will find hundreds of articles about the persecution of black Americans. Um, if you wanted to look for you know, particular groups, um, I might focus on event module, so there is one about the uh, forcible sterilization law in July of 1933 in Nazi Germany, how that was um, uh, promulgated and then it was enacted in the beginning of the next year. So you can search published articles on that event and you'll get some of that there. Uh, there's a similar topic on the uh, T4 program, uh, German bishop condemned to killing of people with disabilities. Um, we don't have anything specifically about uh, Roma yet. I've been working really hard to try to get something up there, um, but we're not finding a lot of reporting from the time period um, around a particular event in history. Um, other museums doing projects like this. Um, there are other museums doing citizen history. There are not so many of them. Uh, Forest Theater did a similar citizen history project um, a number of years ago called Remembering Lincoln. Um, that was slightly different in how they went about it. There's a lot of more traditional crowdsourcing projects. Um, the Zooniverse does a lot of crowdsourcing projects. There's a transcription project from uh, the Library of Congress and National Archives. Um, so we're still hoping that more institutions will do citizen history as we're defining it, uh, which has education and research goals, uh, but there aren't too many examples that I know of. On the current image, uh, headline article, oh, article type. Yes, there was a question about that. So if you submit research, Article type here is one of the options. So cartoon would be Poodle cartoon. I loved teaching Poodle cartoons. There's so much opportunity if your students, uh, they're hard to find because you can't really search any keyword for them, uh, but they might've been a particular editorial page that they were found on. Uh, editorial or opinion piece, relatively straightforward as is letters to the editor, news article, and then other would include say a photograph, a poem, a speech with very little commentary, um, a map, something along those lines. Um, I do know, I think we're getting to the end of the question, so I don't know, or the my time frame, so I don't know if I just 
ran out of time or answered all the questions, um, let me know. Thanks, Eric. I don't think there's any more open questions, um, but I appreciate you um, tackling all of those. And um, we really appreciate your, your time and your expertise. So um, yeah, hopefully some of these folks can look forward to using the resource this year. Yes, thank you so much again for the opportunity. Um, I really hope that I hear uh, from some of the educators if it's useful for you. And um, I hope that you'll have a chance to see the Americans exhibition. So thank you again so much for letting me speak with you all. Yeah, those of us here at Gonzaga are um, about to head to see the traveling exhibit next in just a couple of minutes. So we're excited to take a look and apply what we've learned. So um, thank you so much, Eric. We'll be sure to get the resource links that you mentioned and that you sent me out to everybody who uh, was here uh, Zooming in or here in person. So um, again, thank you so much. And I think that concludes our program today. We'll see you later.